on the legal moralist rationale for drug policy, we can criminalize drug use because drug use is immoral. Like the other principles, the argument that we'll use has exactly the same format for the legal moralist. We start off with the first premise, which is just the legal moralist claim. Then we get a claim that the thing in question, and in our case it will be drugs, is in fact immoral, and therefore we conclude that we can criminalize that thing. In order to see whether or not the legal moralist principle can give us any justification for criminalizing drug use, we need to start by getting the hang of what the legal moralist principle is actually claiming. So the first thing to notice about the legal moralist principle is that it's completely unrestricted in scope. That means that it's asserting that anything, as long as it's wrong, can be criminalized. And there may be some downsides to being that, uh, that to having such a strong claim. Now, some of the problems might crop up because it's just really hard to make laws and enforce laws for lots and lots of kinds of, of transgressions, especially when they're small. So you might have, for example, political difficulties. Um, just you'd have difficulties getting people to vote to make certain things illegal or to impose the kinds of policies in enforcement that would be necessary to enforce the law. You might also have jurisprudential difficulties, and by that I just mean that there could be problems with the way the court system would function given, uh, given a completely unrestricted set of laws. And so this might actually give you a reason not to take everything into account or allow the offense or sorry allow the legal moralist principle to govern anything that's to govern everything that's immoral the analogy here is one of the objections to the death penalty some people um, in discussing the death penalty say that it's true that some people do deserve to die and that the government does have a proper role so in principle a government could legitimately uh, have and, and apply the death penalty. But because the justice system is so screwed up in many ways, it just isn't possible, given the way our justice system works, to have a, a death penalty system so that we are always completely certain that we are only executing the people who deserve to be executed. And so somebody holding this view might say that as a matter of moral justification, it's perfectly fine to, um, to have a death penalty, but as a matter of fact, in this particular country, we just can't do that. So it's unjustified, it would be unjustified to have a death penalty. Now, the parallel for the legal moralist is just to say that, in principle, we could outlaw anything and everything that is immoral. But because there's so much trouble in trying to um, enforce that, we could, you know, we, we shouldn't try to outlaw everything. We should kind of be more modest in the sorts of things that we make our laws about. But still, in principle, it's we would be justified in criminalizing anything no matter what. And to see that, you can think of the you can think of what happens if we get better if we were to get better technology. So for example, um, we we might not try to criticize or we might we might ref not make things uh, make let's say, um, certain kinds of speech, like offensive speech or hate speech, uh, or things that are things that are wrong to say, you know, that kind of content, we might not prohibit that 
um, because it's just too hard to decide when somebody is making this kind of is doing this kind of thing, and it's too hard to catch people and sort of um, universally block them from doing it. But suppose that we developed a technology that allowed us to do it. So, for example, when I was in China, they have a very highly uh, sophisticated filtering system that blocks websites from the outside, you know, outside of China that contain content that the government has deemed to be inappropriate and unacceptable. So if we were to have a technological development where we were able to more accurately and efficiently apply the criminal law to even small transgressions, then the legal moralist would sh should say, yeah, sure, absolutely, we should now go ahead and make these things illegal. So that's what I mean when I say that there's no um, difficulty in principle, or there's no restriction in principle, if you take on, sorry, there's no restriction in principle on what sort of things you can criminalize if you accept the legal moralist principle as we have it so far. But there's a deeper concern here that's not just purely practical about whether or not we should have the law extend to everything that is immoral. There's actually a conflict with our presumption of liberty that is very, very, you know, that is our sort of basic starting point. And again, if a principle conflicts with our presumption of liberty, if it can't respect that, then we can't use that principle. So in order to see what I'm talking about here, start, let's start off by thinking about some cases where, as a matter of fact, as things actually are, there are actions and activities, things people do, that are wrong, they're immoral, but which are not covered by the criminal law. So take a minute, pause the video, and write down some possibilities. P write down some, some situations or some things that people can do that are wrong, but are not governed by the criminal law. So here's one example. As a matter of fact, it is not illegal to lie to people, with the small exception of certain kinds of official context. And by that, I mean basically a situation in which you have put your, you have legally sworn to tell the truth. So you can't lie to a judge. You can't lie when you are under oath because that constitutes perjury. You, you can't lie to uh, police officers or FBI agents in certain in certain circumstances, and but you can lie to your friends, your pets, your children, your parents, your teachers, anyone else outside of these special legal official contexts. It's certainly wrong to lie to people, especially your teachers, but that doesn't mean that the criminal law, that doesn't mean that the police can come and arrest you for lying. You can suffer consequences. People can not like you. Teachers can fail you. Uh, all sorts of things like that that are appropriate responses to being lied to. But there is no legal ramification unless you are lying in a special official context or in cases where you're making a contract or something where it would constitute fraud. Along a similar line, breaking contracts, you know, failure to do what you said you would do in a business context is perfectly legal. So if I have a company and I say I'm going to sell you 10 fish tomorrow, I'll give you 10 fish tomorrow if you give me $20 today, and you go, okay, sure, that sounds great, and then we get to tomorrow, and I say, you know what? I could only get in five fish. So here's your five fish. And you're like, well, but you said you'd give me like, you know, a lot more fish than that. I want my money back, you'd say. And I say, well, no, sorry. That's all the fish I could get. Well, I've broken a contract and there's a ramification. You take me to court and as two private parties, 
we sue each other. So remember, in defining a crime, a, de a crime always has the state versus the defendant. But in a civil case, there's the just the two parties. And in these cases, the judge is not trying to give punishment or anything like that. The judge is simply trying to decide what the contract demanded, whether or not the contract was fulfilled, and if it wasn't fulfilled, how that situation should be remedied. You know, maybe the judge would order me to give you some of your money back, or to give you a discount on future fish, or all sorts of other remedies like that. But there is no place in here for the criminal law. That can come up if there, in certain cases where I've actually defrauded you, where I've made the contract by misleading you into some important facts about the contract. But that's but the general case where you have agreed to something and then you back out of it or you don't fulfill your end of the deal, the government can help the other party get what you had promised them, but that's not using the criminal law. It doesn't involve the police, it doesn't involve prosecutors, and most importantly, it does not involve punishment. The third case I want to focus on is infidelity. Now, we all agree, at least I hope we do, that it's wrong to sleep with somebody who you have promised your significant other that you would not sleep with. That is cheating. That is wrong. However, there is nothing that the state can do criminally if you are caught cheating. Now, obviously, you deserve all sorts of bad, bad things to happen to you. But again, those bad things are between you and the person or persons that you've cheated on. It's purely a personal matter. And while it's a really significant um, moral transgression, you've really done something big and bad, the government has no place in it. So what I just talked about, and probably what's going on with most of the things you just wrote down, is just the fact. It's, it's just a fact about how the law treats certain kinds of activities and how it doesn't treat others. But what I want to say now is that it sh this is exactly how it should be. There shouldn't be laws against things like um, lying in non-official contexts, breach of contract, or even infidelity. And that's because if you had the criminal law extend into those areas of a person's life, you would be violating the presumption of liberty. So to explain that, let me say a little bit more about another dimension of the, person, the presumption of liberty. So remember that what, what we value is people's ability to come up with a sort of plan for their life and make decisions about what it is they want. Uh, want out of life, who they want to be with, who they want to be, all those sorts of things um, are supposed to be uh, available to each and every individual within, within the society. Liberty requires having the opportunity and the capacity to cultivate those kinds of things. Now, in order to be able to make decisions about who you want to be or who you want to be with and to then carry out your decisions to live the kind of life that you you know to the best extent possible that you really want to live there has to be a certain amount of privacy and a certain amount of freedom from an outside entity looking at you you know, think of it this way. If you're always looking over your shoulder, you're always going to be overly careful about what you choose to do. You're never going to be 
potentially you're never going to be completely making choices based on what you want in those areas where you are being supervised so when i'm when i say that there's a requirement that you have unsupervised adult interactions with others that i just mean that certain kinds of relationships have to have have to be private they have to be outside of the inspection of any outside entity so now you should be able to see from what i just said why these things why these are areas of one's life that government intrusion that is the possibility the constant possibility of the government getting involved could be a very significant um, infringement on a person's liberty. So take a line. Now, who you want to be includes what kind of person you want to be. If you decide that you want to be an asshole and always lie and not tell the truth and manipulate people because that's the kind of person you want to be, well, you ought to be free to be that kind of person. Now, that's not to say that those are things that you should be. You've decided that you want to be an asshole, and the rest of us would be very justified in not wanting to be your friends. But still, that's a choice about how you want to be, who you want to be, and the presumption of liberty demands that you be free to develop your own character in the way that you want. So that means that there has to be a complete freedom from government coercion and government infringement on your ability to decide whether or not to tell the truth in particular situations. Cases of breach of contract probably also are important for your liberty because even if we're not talking about people working in companies, your ability to act as an adult means that you have to be able to enter into all sorts of different kinds of relationships with other adult people. That means that you have to be able to choose how you want to be treated by them. You have to demand, be able to demand to be treated in a certain way. And you have to be able to respond appropriately to the way that they are treating you. So if the government's there as kind of a nanny, even if they're there to only have your back, to force people to you know, keep their word to you, again, you are not being able to sort of be fully in control of the kinds of relationships that you enter into and the kind of opportunities that you create for yourself or the kind of opportunities that you lose when you shoot yourself in the foot. You have to be free to fail and to be to do things that screw yourself over and not, you know, and not forced to stay in line if you are going to be able to live the kind of life to that you want to be, that you want to live. And so obviously then, given that our romantic relationships are some of the most important dimensions of ourselves, who you choose to spend your, your time with and your life with is extraordinarily important because it's part of who you are. You shouldn't think of you know being in a relationship as being two se completely separate people. At a certain point, you know, the person that you're with rubs off on you just like you do on them. No comment, right? So, if you are not free to interact with the person that you care the most about in whatever way you choose, then that relationship's going to be stunted. You're going to be limited in your ability to have a real relationship with somebody else. I mean, think of it this way. If your 
boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever said to you, wow, honey, I could have had sex with this attractive stranger while I was away on that last business trip, but I didn't. You'd probably be like, well, okay, glad you're telling me this. But yeah, okay, that's good. You know, I, you told me no sex with other people. I said, no, you know, I told you the same thing. So, uh, you know, uh, you didn't break your promise to me. That's great. If, if, if you're significant other there then says well no I, it wasn't because I promised you I wasn't going to sleep with other people it was because I was afraid I'd get arrested if you know if I got caught because there was cops in the bar that's not showing you know they're they're fulfilling their promise of uh, fidelity to you is that it just seems cheap right it just seems like they are um not doing what they said they were, would do for the right reasons. And so if there's always the possibility of the government stepping in, even if people do things for the right reasons, they don't have sex with the attractive stranger because they care about you and they promised you they wouldn't have sex with anybody else other than you. If there's still the possibility of the government stepping in or the gov government observing, then it's hard for people to be absolutely certain that the reasons why someone else or even th they themselves are maintaining their promises are th the right reasons. You know, a lot of times people don't know their own motivations and it could be very disconcerting to have to think and wonder, gosh, am I refusing to, you know, the attractive stranger's advances because I care deeply about my partner? Or am I doing it because I'm afraid of jail? You certainly are afraid of jail. And you care about your partner and your promises. And at least to me, it seems like I wouldn't want to be ever doubting which reasons I was acting for in these kinds of situations. So insofar as you believe this, then the ability of, then the, the way in which the law leaves these areas of people's lives alone is compatible with the presumption of liberty. But the unrestricted legal moralist principle doesn't leave these areas alone. And so therefore, it seems like it's going to be in conflict with the presumption of liberty and therefore it's not going to be a good liberty limiting principle. So the way to deal with this is to restrict the legal moralist principle to make it weaker and by weaker I don't mean like worse in fact as my old advisor used to say um, principles that are weaker are therefore stronger. What I mean is the the principle doesn't cover as many things and so it's stronger in the sense that it's harder to overturn because it's not reaching too far out there and so what we can do then is say well look a lot of these cases involve uh, things that are not sufficiently immoral that the law just shouldn't be concerned with because they don't rise to a certain level and so we can call this the revised legal moralist principle. But once we decide to restrict the legal moralist principle in this way, we run into at least three important difficulties. If we're going to restrict legal moralism to just the sufficiently immoral stuff, then the first thing we need to know is where to draw the line. That is, what sort of things are sufficiently immoral. And it's not going to be enough to just give a list of stuff because that list could be arbitrary. What we want, again, is things that are justified, good moral justifications. So we need some kind of principled place to draw the line. We need to have some sort of reason to draw the line in a particular spot. And that means, so that means that the place that we, you know, draw the line between the not the insufficiently immoral 
and the sufficiently immoral has to be governed by some kind of principle. And it's going to be up to the legal moralist to find that principle. And again, that principle is going to have to respect the presumption of liberty. Now, that can be both, that can be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it creates a serious pressure to find a good place to draw the line. But on the other hand, it actually might help. The legal moralist could look to the importance of liberty and try to figure out what respect for liberty would demand and how that would help us draw the lines in particular places. There's going to be, as you can obviously see, this is going to be a really complicated and difficult endeavor. And you might take it just a minute or two to try some hypothesis, you know, just make make some uh, attempts of, of how of how you would distinguish between sufficiently and insufficiently immoral. Just write them out and try to think through them a bit. And I think that will probably, and that will probably help you get the hang of this a little bit better. In addition to the need to have a principled place for drawing the line, we face another problem which is mainly epistemic. And epistemic just means having to do with knowledge. So that just means that we have um, the, the it's it's difficult to know where what things are in fact right and wrong so we're not worrying this isn't a worry about how do we determine which wrong things to criminalize this is the worry how do we know which things are wrong and yes this does get us into meta ethics a bit but it also can be just practical you know, the whole reason we have debates over moral issues is that even within va one value system, there can be ambiguities and disagreements. And this is the whole reason that we have ethicists around, you know, to try to give us some sort of help in sorting this stuff out. But it's super, you know, so that's important just for any view because we need we want to know what things are right and what things are wrong in life but if you're a legal moralist this is not just a matter of you know sort of sorting through and revising our beliefs and our practices it's actually a matter of how we make the law and so we're faced with some, with a subject area that is hard to grasp and is unwieldy and is ambi ambiguous in many cases and is just overall difficult and that's the way, by the way, it should be. Human life is difficult and complicated. If your ethics is simple, then it's not a very good ethical system. So given that, that fact about uh, ethics and morality, the legal moralist is, faces a huge challenge in designing laws because laws have to be definite. A law can't be open to too much interpretation, otherwise it's unfair. Laws have to be written in a very specific way and applied in a very specific way so that they can be consistent and they can be fair. So the fact that it's very hard to deal with and to know exactly which things are right and wrong creates a serious, another serious problem for the legal moralist. So now we come to the biggest, I think, of the problems. Because the, the first two were a bit philosophical and a bit practical. But they seem like they can be overcome by just doing a bit of, I mean, they, at least in principle, they seem like a, a bunch of good and hard work might help us make some decent progress on them. And so in, they seem like they might be things that we can overcome. But this third problem, may well this third problem if it cannot be answered is fatal to the legal moralist and this is the same problem we saw earlier with the offense principle and it's just that generally who is it that gets to have their moral values enshrined into the law if you have a modern society with many different cultures living within it, 
And actually, even if you just had one main culture, because there's a lot of variation among people within a culture, but let's just focus on the multicultural situation. If you have a big society where there's multiple cultures within it, and the law has to be definite. We can't just leave stuff open for, you know, oh, well, if you are of this culture, then th these are the rules, but these are rules for another culture. The law can't be like that and still be fair. The law has to say, this is wrong, this is punished by, you know, X amount of time in, in jail. Otherwise, it becomes arbitrary and that's not fair. So the legal moralist has to explain how we can create laws based on morality when the different peoples that live together in a society have different value systems. And again, this is not just a practical matter. It's not just, well, you know, we could get together and vote on it and stuff like that. No, this actually, again, is a point of conflict directly with our fundamental ba our fundamental sort of moral basis which is the presumption of liberty and it's really important to be clear about how this goes if you so to see this think for suppose that we just said well whatever the majority group is their views get enshrined into the law they're the ones whose views count if that was if we did that, then it's not just that the minority is being sort of discriminated against or that their values are not being sort of uh, getting, you know, getting to rise to the same level. It's that we are now treating some individuals unequally. Remember that the whole point of the presumption of liberty is that we want to respect everybody's individual ability to determine what is a worthwhile life for them, what sort of things they value. And we have to do that equally for every single person, or now speaking more generally, every, major, every uh, cultural group with distinctive value systems. If we privilege the majority over the others, even if it doesn't you know, result in any hardship or whatever um, for the minority, it's still elevating one group's values over the others. And that means the minority group's values are not being treated as equally important. And that is a direct violation of the whole basis of, you know, the whole moral basis, the, the moral justification for having a government in the first place. So the state, so the legal moralist needs to over overcome that hurdle. And it's a really, really huge hurdle. And it has to do this in a way that is non-trivial. Let me say first the way in which, you know, say first how legal moralists try to deal with this. And then, uh, and then a, a, the idea of it being trivial, that will be a little bit more clear than if I just try to say it right now. So in this picture, let's suppose that there are three groups living within a society, and each group has its own set of moral values. Now, the thing that's in the circle for each group is everything that that group's moral code says is wrong. On this picture, then, none, uh, none of the groups share anything in common. They are all have, none of them believe that the same things are wrong. In this, if this is how a society's populations were related to each other, um, it would be impossible for the legal moralist to overcome the objection. But this, of course, isn't how it really is with any set of moral codes. It's not as though there are complete and total disagreements. Any moral code, any two moral codes will agree on some things. So, for example, um, no society could survive if it didn't have a prohibition on murder 
or something like a prohibition on theft. Different societies may, can, may have different ideas about what constitutes theft, but there's going to be a general, but there will have to be some kind of general prohibition on that. So it looks like then the, the, the problem isn't completely unsolvable because we can assume that a bunch of groups living together in the same society will have different values, but those values will overlap in certain important ways. So, for example, while group one might believe that eating meat is wrong, and group two might believe that eating meat is very important, and group three might have no sort of moral beliefs about meat one way or the other, they all still could agree that it's wrong to kill people. And so, while the criminal law would not, they, it would not be justified to make any criminal law that is related to meat eating, it would be perfectly justified to make a criminal law that prevents people from killing each other. So the whole task then is to give an account which shows where um, the moral values and moral beliefs of people in a society will overlap and then show that it is they overlap enough that we can get a really um, usable legal moralist system going. Now when I say a the attempt is to get a usable legal moralist system going, what I mean is that the legal moralist picture and the set of moral values that are endorsed on the on you know in a particular society by a legal moralist has to be non-trivial. And by that what I mean is well, there's two ways that that a uh, a legal moralist set of uh, rationales for criminal laws could be trivial. So the first way is that the while there are some areas of agreement between the different cultures, there aren't enough of them, right? So you know it's true that there are laws against uh, you know we can make criminal laws against things like uh, murder and rape and theft and all sorts of stuff like and you know the the really big ticket things but if you know but our criminal law needs to cover a lot more than that and if there isn't enough agreement to allow us to get um, other things that might not be like those central cases um, if our criminal if we don't have agreement on those then the legal moralist principle isn't going to be able to cover very much. So it's just basically going to be saying something like, yeah, we can outlaw murder and, you know, stealing stuff. But that's about all it could justify. It couldn't, you know, it could, it definitely couldn't get us anything about uh, drugs because different groups do have very different opinions about drug use. Now there's a second problem here, which should be, re which you might have thought of in, uh, on the last slide when I said that the different groups all are going to have probably some rule against theft although they might differ well the that's really important because what I've been talking about is sort of murder as a uh, a general thing but what we need is a very specific notion of murder if we're going to make a law so there's details and details which matter. So you can matter. You can imagine, for example, a religious group that is so anti-violence that they believe that not even killings in self-defense could ever be morally justified. And if you had a society where this group was a member, then that means that no any murder statute would have to just be completely blanket and not involve any of the relevant nuance because the nuances you know when we count something as a killing in self-defense when we count it as full-on murder when we count it as manslaughter or even whether there should be differences between those those are the sorts of things that we're going to that we want our legal moralist 
uh, system to be able to justify. But it looks really easy to not, you know, to have uh, disagreements about the details, which wouldn't allow us to get to that kind of uh, level, level of sort of um, specificity. You know, we couldn't be specific because there wouldn't be enough overlap. Um, or to take another example, right? Different societies are going to have very different conceptions of property. And so what one group might, uh, might regard as theft not, might not necessarily be the same thing. So we can all agree, yeah, okay, people should be able to have stuff, you know, that's, that's theirs. And that it's wrong for other people to come and deprive people of the stuff that, that's theirs. But then, you know, that's, that's almost trivial. That doesn't tell us very much because we need to know, okay, well, what kinds of things is it important for people to be able to possess? And what, you know, in what situations is, should we regard one person as taking another person's stuff or illegitimately taking another person's stuff? So, you know, even just in the American law, there's disagreements about what count, you know, when you have abandoned property and when picking up, so, you know, picking up something that looks like abandoned property. Well, you know, when exactly does property become abandoned? Or, and so when is taking something that someone's left behind just simply picking up something? And when is it actually still stealing their stuff? So even, you know, in, in, the sort of Anglo-American context, there's room for dispute. You can imagine how different societies that have different beliefs about um, individual relationships and property and all that, you can imagine that there would be a lot of room for for differences. And that's gonna, looks like it's gonna create a lot of trouble for trying to make the sort of specific laws that we'll need. Now, the second, the second way in which a uh, legal moralist system might turn out to be trivial involves more sort of the practical application of it. So we can think about that by starting in on our topic of drug use, right? So if a, we're looking for legal moralist reasons for prohibiting the use of drugs, so obviously those reasons are going to be claims about the wrongness of using drugs. But we want these reasons to be distinctively legal moralist. They want they need to be something the kind of reasons that set legal moralism apart from the other uh, from the other li liberty limiting principles. So what the the problem of triviality could arise if legal moralism can only say the things that other principles say. So remember that the offense principle in a way built in legal moralism. Things were that were prohibitable were only the things that lay inside the area where the two circles overlap, right? Because to be criminalizably offensive, it has to be offensive and it has to be wrong. So only the things that lie within the overlap of the two circles can be prohibited on the offense principle. That's why I said last time, it looks like the offense principle just collapses into the legal moralist principle. There's nothing more to be said in order to uh, or there's nothing special about offense. Really, it just seems like what we're talking about is the wrongness of using the drugs. And again, if legal moralism is going to give us distinctive reasons that are unique to the legal moralist framework, it's going to not be able to give us the same kinds of... It's not going. It's going to have to be able to tell us we can make laws in cases that the other principles wouldn't say we can make laws. So in addition to offense, the harm principle tells us that we can prohibit drug use because drug use is harmful to other people, 
people other than the user, right? Well, harming others is always wrong. So everything the harm principle can say that we should prohibit is going to also be covered by the legal moralist theory. That means that if legal moralism is going to avoid being trivial, at least insofar as we're talking about drug policy, it's going to have to be able to give us reasons for criminalizing drug use that are not covered by the offense principle and not covered by the harm principle, or also the paternalist principle, but I haven't put that on the chart. So for a legal moralist theory to give us some reasons to um, prohibit drugs, those reasons are going to come from ways that dr drug use is wrong that fall into the red area of the circle.